Um, today's webinar is on fall prevention and protection in the roofing industry. And uh, for those of you who have not attended CPWR webinars before, my name is Jessica Bunting and I host these events. I'm just here to make sure things go smoothly and to provide some technical support as needed. Um, so again, if you're having trouble at any point, you can send me a message in the chat or uh, Q&A, um, or if you can email me by responding to um, any of the WebEx registration or reminder emails that went out. Um, if you're logged in and experiencing difficulties with the sound through your computer speakers, I recommend calling in using your phone instead. Um, you just should make sure that you either disconnect the audio from your computer or turn off your speakers to avoid an echo. Uh, we will take time at the end of the presentation today to answer questions. And you can enter those um, in the Q&A or chat box at any time during the presentation. We'll do our best to answer all of them um, at the end, but we have a lot of people registered. Um, so if we don't get to your question, um, we are uh, happy to follow up. We will have a record of it um, so we can get in touch with you after the event, or you can feel free to email me with any questions that weren't answered on the webinar. Um, we are also recording the webinar today, and I will share that automatically with everyone who um, registered uh, you don't have to do anything uh, to get that. I'll send it out within a few days. Um, and just to uh, respond to uh, questions coming in, um, everyone other than the presenters is currently muted and will remain muted um, for the duration of today's event. So if you have any questions, you do have to type them in um, via the chat or Q&A box. All right. Um, Scott Ketchum has joined us today from OSHA to start us off uh, with some background on falls and the OSHA NIOSH CPWR fall prevention campaign. And uh, Scott is the director of OSHA's Directorate of Construction. He's been very involved um, in the planning of the national safety stand down every year. Um, and so Scott, I will hand it over to you, I'm giving you control now to get us started. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jessica, and it's a uh, pleasure to be here today. Um, I wanted to first start off by thanking you for all you do to protect workers in the in the out in the workplace. Um, and in these tough times, um, I hope I wish you the be very best as far as uh, being safe and well in these in these tough environments that uh, we're working in now. Um, again. Uh, we're, we're with you in this, we're, we're, uh, we want to make sure that you're safe and uh, in this working environment. And uh, today's discussion is about fall, uh, but at the very end, I'll have a few, I'll have a link that uh, can get you to information uh, if you're interested in, uh, in the current environment with COVID-19. So without any further ado, I'm going to start off with what are we, what are we working for here? Um, about five to seven years ago, OSHA started with a construction focus four um, uh, project that uh, we have moved forward on every year to try to keep the idea, uh, to keep the issue of the four main elements that are, are killing, are leading to the deaths or incidents in the construction industry. And those four, uh, uh, those focus four elements are, number one, falls. Number two, struck by objects. Three, execute, uh, electrocutions, excuse me. And four, caught in between hazards. And you can see that falls is the number one uh, element in this list for a reason. In 2018, uh, BLS data, 338 uh, employees uh, fell from one uh, platform to another, one level to another. And which resulted in, in their um, demise or death. Uh, struck by objects was 11.1%, electrocutions 8.5%, and caught in between at 5.5%. And this has been something that OSHA has been working on for years. Um, and I'd like to start off by saying that on the Focus 4 campaign, if you go to our website, you can download free uh, toolbox talks and uh, specified for each one of these hazard groups that uh, you will find helpful uh, in moving forward uh, information that will hopefully bring this down. 
The next slide that I have is, is getting into a little bit more detail with the BLS data on construction fatal fall incidents. Um, I'm, you know, obviously we strive to bring this number. We'd like to see zero uh, people injured or killed on the job. Um, and on fatal fall incidents, you can see that in the 2018 BLS numbers, um, the result went down by 14% between uh, FY or calendar year 17 and calendar year 18, uh, which according to my peers over in BLS is something that hasn't happened. And, and so uh, we are working to make sure that we continue that trend. Uh, we'd like to see that trend continue down to zero illnesses or deaths uh, related to fatal falls or uh, fatal fall incidents. And you can see on there uh, the different areas uh, where uh, fatal fall incidents have occurred. And uh, I think this is while uh, the, the uh, information is, is heading in the right direction, we'd like to see it go in a, uh, a lot more radical direction uh, to zero um, or to zero incidents uh, with a 100% reduction. And so uh, while this number is showing improvements and we're all in this together, and I, I appreciate everything everyone does uh, to try to prevent these types of incidents, we've still got some work to do, but this is good news. The next slide is about struck by incidents. And uh, fatal struck by incidents is accounted for 112 of fatalities in, in uh, 2018. One of these issues that uh, OSHA has been looking at in relevance to these uh, focus four is you may be aware that we have an agency priority goal for trenching and excavations. And you can see that um, um, uh, actually in this uh, struck by equipment is something that we've been working on uh, uh, and hopefully we can see that number uh, get down. Actually, the, uh, uh, the trench is in, is in the, uh, the last element. Um, so the next one was electrocution incidents in construction with 86 uh, fatal incidents. Um, again, uh, we're, we're seeing these, we're trying to trend these as they, uh, as they move. Uh, and, and hopefully we're seeing all these go down. I focus primarily for this presentation on falls. And then finally, caught in between incidents, and this is where the excavations are. And uh, our agency priority goal uh, was specific about trying to reduce um, crushed in hazards uh, or excavation and trenching cave in hazards to employees. And we've been working very diligently on this and, and we're seeing some positive uh, uh, results in that area as well, uh, resulting of all of our efforts. Um, People always ask me about the top 10 violations we're finding in construction um, from OSHA perspective. And I've shared this several times uh, uh, with other groups, um, large groups and whatnot, and I'm, I'm happy to share it with you here. Uh, the highlighted items in red are the elements that have a fall protection or a fall hazard in it. And you can see that out of the top 10 issues that, uh, top 10 hazards that OSHA uh, issues, uh, fines, apparent violations in, out of those top 10, six of them have a fall protection element in it. Uh, you can see fall protection, the general requirements of 1926-501 is number one. Scaffolding is number two, um, uh, which in many cases uh, has other things, structural issues as well, but uh, a lot of times the issue is a, a fall hazard. Ladders, uh, 1926, uh, 1053 uh, regarding falls in that area, uh, aerial lifts, and then the fall protection systems criteria and practices. And these are the top 10 from uh, 2019 that's based on OSHA data. To put this in a little bit of a different perspective, um, this uh, chart here shows the, the number of uh, violations that OSHA issued. And you can see that 1926-501 for fall protection, all elements of 501 amounted uh, to uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of OSHA's work in construction. Uh, you can see that it was followed up by scaffolding ladders in the same order that uh, you saw the previous chart uh, with uh, head protection in there as well. Uh, and you can see 
uh, as far as the number of willful violations, uh, I point this out to folks that fall protection, willful and repeat, is the number one uh, condition that uh, uh, OSHA finds uh, willful uh, violation conditions or repeat violation conditions in in fall protection. Um, followed closely, uh, secondly, not, not necessarily closely, but uh, secondly, by excavation requirements where you can see that 35 uh, willful violations were issued in 2019 and 81 repeat violations. I thought this information might be helpful uh, for you in looking at the data um, and, and seeing where we, are, where we are with that. Moving on to our cooperative side, um, that's enforcement data. On our cooperative side, you can see that uh, we have uh, outreach initiatives that are going on uh, uh, currently involving the grain safety standup uh, that is going on right now. Um, a lot of these events in the Midwest are, are ongoing or on virtual. Uh, we also have the National Work Zone Awareness Week coming up, which is going to have a virtual component to it as well. Um, the National Safety Stand Down uh, for uh, fall protection to prevent falls in construction has been postponed, and we're looking forward to doing it at a later time in the summer uh, when conditions allow for us to uh, have events uh, that would be uh, successful. Hopefully, we can do it where we have open events together. Um, I will keep you informed. I will keep the in industry informed, as well as um, our partners in C CPWR, NIOSH, and NORA. Uh, we will all keep you informed on uh, events as we determine when that time frame will be. Um, in addition, heat illness prevention campaign is on. Uh, the trenching safety stand down tentatively is still good for June, mid-June. Um, I will let you know uh, uh, via conversations with the National Utility Contractor Association and North American Excavation and Shoring Association uh, who sponsored that event, uh, who run that event. Um, I'll let you know if uh, those dates indeed change and they'll probably, they'll do on their own side, they'll do marketing as well. Um, the Safe and Sound Campaign Week is still on for August 10th through 16th, uh, and I haven't heard anything about that uh, as far as it being postponed. Again, uh, the National Safety Stand Down, I, I wanted to let all of you know that um, due to events uh, involving COVID right now, we are postponing it until a time where it's better suited to, to have the stand down. And I'm proud to be in webinars like this and any other online events that are going on uh, to support uh, prevention of falls in the workplace, uh, but the actual congregational uh, congregation of folks for the, the actual stand down is something that we're gonna monitor very closely and uh, look forward to in the near future. I'll keep you posted. As far as our stakers, stakeholders and partners, we have numerous stakers, stakeholders and partners that are involved in the stand down with us. Probably so many that you couldn't, I mean, I know if we put them all on there, you wouldn't be able to see the screen. Um, we we, we uh, made this slide just to show thanks to uh, folks that were in it since the beginning and, uh, and many others I know have a place on there as well. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, making, uh, in the future, making multiple slides of all our stakeholders and partners uh, moving forward. My last slide on this, I mentioned that I have something about uh, COVID-19. Um, I wanted to, to let you know that OSHA has a, um, a safety and health topics page on the coronavirus at www.osha.gov forward slash coronavirus. And in it, we are updating our, our slide on recommendations and guidelines for enforcement, as well as uh, guidelines for protection of employees in all industries, including construction. Um, so I would, I would ask you if you have a moment to look at that. Um, I would also uh, say that uh, CPWR has a webpage for coronavirus as well, and it, it's an excellent resource. Uh, NIOSH has a, a page, uh, the National Roofing Contractors Association, who is part of this uh, presentation today, 
also has a COVID-19 page. And I think if you look up um, just about every major stakeholder that I looked at uh, online has their uh, own coronavirus page. And there's a lot of information out there. And if you aren't aware of it, there are good places to go to get uh, construction specific information. Um, obviously, OSHA.gov forward slash coronavirus is something that uh, we're updating regularly. And I know our partners out there in the construction safety world as well are updating their information as well. And so I would encourage you uh, to, to take a look out there and see what's on, what other people are doing uh, in order to better protect uh, our most valued resource, which is our employees and, and our families. And in, in the process, we're helping everyone. I appreciate your time for this. And um, I, I wanted to introduce the other members of the panel today. Uh, with us today is the National Roofing Contractors Association, um, Thomas Shanahan, the Vice President of Enterprise Risk Management and Executive Education, Harry Dietz, the Director of Enterprise Risk Management, and Rich Trewin, also the Director of Enterprise Risk, Rich Risk Management. Sorry. Thank you for all being here today. And Tom, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Scott, very much uh, for that, all of that information and, uh, and uh, being such a good partner with us as we try to make a, you know, improvement in all of these numbers that you were putting out there. Um, so as you know, I, I, I guess as you would assume, you know, there's a lot of skill craft, craftsman, craftsmanship and of course, danger uh, in working in the roofing industry. Um, first off, our workplace is up, as you can see from this picture here. And that presents and explains a lot of the information and, and why we are so active. Uh, partners with CPWR and our, uh, OSHA and others to make uh, improvements in, in the workplaces here so our work home safely. Uh, just kind of dovetailing off what Scott talked about a little earlier, um, we represent in terms of, if you look at the bottom, the roofing company fatalities accounted for 106 deaths of that uh, 1,008 in 2018, so about 10%. However, as Scott was talking about earlier, 77%, or rather 77 of our 106, so about 73% are from falls. So you can see for NRCA and for the roofing industry, looking at falls, how they happen, you know, what are the precipitating causes um, and doing everything we can to get at them is so material to us because that's where our workers primarily and making that dent can have a significant impact on, uh, on our industry and in these numbers in particular, because these numbers aren't just numbers, they're actually people. And just again, Scott went over this earlier, but just wanted to point that as we look at it, we, he was talking about construction more in general, uh, but if we look at roofing in particular, we track right along with, uh, in terms of citations, being with the duty to have fall protection, ladders, uh, training requirements for fall protection, uh, and then also systems and criteria there. So in the top six, you'll see that it's all fall protection ladder related issues. So the first part is, is our duty uh, to have fall protection when you look at the regulations. So whenever you're at, at elevation of six feet or greater, you gotta do something to protect the worker. But we also wanna protect workers from having uh, things fall on them, hammers, whatever. So it's just not people falling, it's also stuff falling. And in particular for roofing work, one of the things that's so key is the surface on which work will be performed must be looked at so that we can say, hey, it's safe for our guys and, and, and women to be up on the roof doing their work. And that's not always very easy because not off, very often rather, uh, looking and trying to see the underside of the deck in, from inside the building is almost impossible because of a lot of different reasons. This particular uh, picture that you see here sadly was from uh, as a worker who did fall through a, a, a roof. Um, and uh, this particular roofing contractor actually had access and did the um, 
investigation to see that the, it looked sound, and which it did. He had the pictures for it and still something uh, went wrong. And of course, the investigations showed what had happened. But the idea here is how important it is to be making that effort to, to investigate as best you can that the surface on which workers will be working will indeed be safe. So conventional fall protection systems, I'm sure everybody on the call is familiar with this, guardrail systems, safety net systems, personal fall arrest systems. In roofing work, generally we're dealing with guardrail systems and personal fall arrest systems in terms of conventional. Um, nets are used right, primarily uh, how I see them or what we see is uh, new construction activities, especially over larger skylights. Um, and I can remember a job many years ago where the uh, roofing work was being done on a building that was uh, on a river. And that one side of the river, when they had to get over there because of the work they were doing, they put a net out uh, because no other kind of fall protection was, was available uh, to be used practically speaking. So it's a rarity, it happens. Uh, but primarily we deal with guardrail and personal fall arrest systems for conventional methods. Um, but in particular for low slope roofing, now low slope roof uh, defined by OSHA is one that uh, has a slope of four inches over 12 inches, so four and 12 uh, or less. And there, uh, if you're doing roofing work, uh, roofing work, uh, you can use a warning line with conventional methods or a warning line and a safety monitoring system. And on roofs that are 50 feet or less in width, safety monitoring systems alone. Now, one of the things I want to mention about as we start looking at warning line systems, and it's been uh, in a topic of a lot of discussion over the years. Um, you know, we look at uh, fall protection, and what we encourage contractors to do in all of our training is to be creating a fall protection plan for your job site. And in that fall protection plan, what we, similar to any other thing, the hierarchy of controls approach to, to uh, fall prevention. You know, what are the things can you substitute? Are there ways that instead of using ladders, for example, to get access to the roof, are there interior stairwells? And other, so, uh, what are the other ways? It, you know, are there parapets or can we create uh, barriers uh, in such a, we'll talk about those things. And in certain cases, as you move down the hierarchy, at some point, warning lines become the method because of the nature of the work that's going on. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the specifics of warning lines and safety monitors. Um, but again, this is a hierarchical situation. And of course, the challenge with roofing is that no two roofs are basically alike. It's a very dynamic versus a static workplace. So it's always changing. And so we have to be ever mindful of what are our options what are the things we can be doing to protect workers in the plan for that? So uh, one of the things uh, looking at in terms of regulations is when you have an unprotected side or edge, if there is a parapet or railing at least 39 inches high, then that is considered a proper barrier. Uh, one thing that's been going on in new construction a lot lately is because roof spaces are being used much more now for green uh, spaces and for recreational spaces. So we're seeing a lot more buildings being built with at least 39 inch walls there, which is great. I mean, if every roof had a 39 inch uh, parapet on it, uh, fall protection would be so much easier, obviously. That's not the case, obviously, but we're seeing more and more of that uh, in new designs. Of course, with green roofs and with it, the spaces uh, being used up there, we're having more activity up there, which of course means there's more exposure. So leading edge work is something that uh, is, is obviously a part of the roofing process. In terms of OSHA, roofing work is the deck up. So the warning lines and, and, and uh, safety monitoring systems, for example, would not apply in this situation because this is the actual construction of the deck. Um, in roofing work, generally our work is, you know, somewhere depending on the economy between 75 and uh, maybe 85 and upwards percent re-roofing reconstruction maintenance type activities. So new construction activities uh, represent a much smaller proportion of our exposure. Um, and just because if you think about it, everything has a roof on it. So, but the majority of the roofing work that we do is not this type of work here. But when it is being done, leading edge is very important and uh, conventional methods are what's, uh, what the regulations require there. Uh, for steep slope roofing, so now once you get on roofs that are greater than uh, 4 and 12, when generally we think of residential roofs in this 
in this particular case, but it's not always. I mean, in the roofing industry, we delineate by slope, whether it's low or steep slope. Although many people assume residential means steep and commercial means uh, low or flat, that really is not the case. Uh, we have to really look at these things in terms of slope and the exposures that occur there. So once you're over four and 12, again, the six feet uh, uh, height, ground, uh, Ball height distance is in play. And now we protect uh, with conventional systems, safety nets, personal fall arrest systems, and also guardrails, but now we add tow boards. And the reason for adding tow boards in particular is because once you're up on a sloped roof and, you, and your hammer uh, drops and it could easily slide depending on the slope of that roof, those uh, tow boards will hopefully grab a stop a uh, hammer or whatever screwdriver from falling down. Remember part of the fall protection regulations is that we wanna protect people on lower levels from falling objects. And this would be one way of doing it. Tow boards are not uh, meant uh, to be holding up, and in terms of guardrails, holding up people by themselves, the entire guardrail is. So there, are, there is an exception to subpart M, uh, 1926 500, where the regulations are found, that it does not apply when workers are inspecting, investigating, or assessing a workplace, either before work has started or after it has been completed. And that's an important aspect for exposures in the roofing industry because to, if, if you want us to bid your job, we have to actually go up on your roof to, to do that inspection and to assess the roof to see its condition and what have you. Now, one of the, you know, in terms of the hierarchy of controls, you know, substitution is, a, is, is a terrific if that can be done. So uh, drones these days are being used a lot more for the purpose of assessing uh, roofs for the purpose of, uh, of doing the uh, bidding. Now, it's not something that can be used universally, uh, but it is being used more. And what I like about it from a risk management perspective is we're reducing the exposure when you're, when you're able to use other methods like that. But in, in, when that's not possible, you, you have to get up there and check things out. And so that exposure is there. So we want to keep that to a minimum, obviously. Um, here we go. So then getting into the actual construction of the conventional fall protection systems, we've got guardrails with the top rail, mid rail, and tow board. And guardrail, uh, the top rail is 42 inches plus or minus three inches. And in the regulations in Appendix B, there's a sort of recipe to make this kind of uh, guardrail on the job. Generally speaking, though, most roofing contractors aren't doing this anymore. You'll see this more in new construction activity. Uh, like I said, the majority of our work is re-roofing, uh, reconstruction, repair, maintenance type activities. And if there are guardrails, if the work is of duration, guardrails uh, are, you can purchase them and, and, and they're easily erected and taken down. And that, that makes them so much more easy to use these days. Uh, morning lines, uh, getting into unconventional systems uh, as a barrier erected around uh, the work area uh, where there's an unprotected side or edge. And then the roofing work is, that's going on within the uh, warning lines, it, it can be done without any other kind of fall protection. Now, there are some state plans where that's not the case. And so uh, NRC actually has a uh, fall protection video program that uh, you can get that actually goes through all 50 states and gives you the regulations and uh, the requirements for each of the states when state plans are different than the federal uh, guidelines. Today we're talking about the federal guidelines. Um, so in that particular case, the warning line system is used uh, because as you, you might imagine, uh, if you're not familiar with roofing work, oftentimes it, 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 it's rolled out in one shape or form or another. And so what we have is where the, the, the roll is being rolled out parallel to that activity, the warning line can be six feet from the edge but perpendicular to that activity, the warning line needs to be 10 feet in from the edge. And this comes from the old, uh, uh, when uh, the OSHA standard, uh, OSHA was first formulated back in 1970s, uh, 79 and 80s, when we uh, primarily were doing built up roofing then. And so a roll roofing was, was the norm. And so being, and, and you work backwards. So, so the warning line made a lot of sense in that dynamic and it makes a lot of sense uh, today as well. But again, we consider this as something be done lower in the hierarchy of controls. I mean, we wanna be first looking at guardrails, 
PFAs and those things before we get into warning lines, but they have their place because like I said, the, work, the roofing workplace is very dynamic and uh, one size does not fit all. Oh, okay, moving along here. So then the criteria for warning lines, uh, again, I mentioned the six and 10 foot so we got, and erected around all sides of the work area, flagged at no more than six foot intervals, the height is 34 to 39 inches because that was a typical height of a person's waist where this, if they got close to that edge, they, they, they would, if they were walking backwards in particular, they could feel it and see it. Uh, 16 pounds of tip over force and a tensile strength of 500 pounds. In particular though, with the, uh, you remember one of the options is warning lines and safety monitors. So warning lines and safety monitors requires that the safety monitor be a competent person. And this is a very key aspect of this whole act. Uh, dynamic. In other words, this person needs to know the regulations and needs to have the authority to tell others to stop working. Uh, what we talk about all the time in our training and, and, and our, our, our programs on this is to resist the temptation to use, to have your safety monitor be the newest person on the, on the crew. Um, it often seems like that makes the most sense because you could certainly teach them all the regulations understanding what it is, but remember it's that authority aspect of it too that we wanna be able to make sure that if the safety monitor says, hey, stop working, that the workers actually stop. And that might not likely be the case if that person is the newest person. So having somebody that has the authority like a foreman or a lead man or that kind that has the knowledge is really key here, but they need to be on the same level, be in visual contact and, and most importantly, be able to, that the workers can hear him or her. So then moving on to PFAs, uh, you know, 5,000 pounds strength in terms of D-rings, uh, anchors, and the lifeline lanyards themselves. If it's a self-retracting lifeline that limits to two feet, uh, then 3,000 pounds. But again, and Rich will talk about this a little bit later in terms of pre-fall distances, but that has to be limited to six feet um, uh, so that the worker doesn't fall any uh, greater than that. Well, what's interesting to me and great uh, is, you know, 31 years ago when I was starting at NRCA and I made my first video was on fall protection. And I can remember getting up on the roof and we had the cameraman and the crew and the whole nine yards doing this. And there was no place to anchor and to tie uh, the worker that was being video uh, taped uh, off. And so I was off camera holding the line, you know, so that what was seen on the video was looked and we talked about it correctly. But it really, right away from one of my first couple months at NRCA, I realized how challenging it is, especially back then, to anchor, to find anchor points. Well, today, all these years later, that is a lot easier than it was back then. There are many, many anchors. These are just a sampling of pictures here. The one picture on the top right there is a permanent system. Uh, the top uh, left is a steep slope anchor. Uh, the middle one there on the top there is over a, a parapet or a wall that you could anchor to that, which is great. Uh, there are also portable systems that can now be uh, even brought up via a, 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 a hoist and uh, put together manually on the roof. So there, so there really are not any longer no excuses not to be not to have good solid anchor points. And so this is a big improvement that the industry has made over the decades. Uh, anchors must be independent of other systems used to support or suspend platforms, design, design installed as part of a complete fall protection system and under the supervision of a competent person, which we talked about earlier. Swing fall hazards and steep slope roofing is very key thing to be aware of. Uh, the anchor point should be uh, as best above the worker. You can see in that left picture that when it's too far to the left or right, that you create a swing fall hazard when that line is pulled out too far and if somebody were to fall. And uh, this uh, may be an easy way to go down to the truck to get something, but it doesn't feel very good when it happens. So having anchor points that are above the worker that are at least uh, three to six feet in from the edge is very key to keeping those accidents down. Hoist areas, of course, you're up on a roof and we're hoisting all the time. Uh, PFAs and guardrails are required there. Uh, and then holes and skylights, another uh, key area that we deal with falling through here. And you can see in that picture there, 
that that skylight, uh, uh, the inside of it there, you can see how it's discolored. It's, it's, it's got that brown look to it. And that's because this particular skylight, which popped very easily, was because uh, it just had been dried out over the years. The plastic had become oxidized to the point where it was very brittle. It was keeping out the rain and the snow, but any kind of pressure which happened on this particular uh, job site, it just popped it. Um, and so never sitting on skylights, never using them in any way to support anything. And now again, uh, today we have different kinds of uh, mechanisms. Like in, you can see in the picture in the forefront here, of a, um, a portable screen that can be put over it, but they must be protected. Workers must be protected either by covers, guardrails, or personal fall arrest systems. And of course, again, materials falling through them. Um, criteria for holes or covers is that when you use covers that they're secured, capable of supporting at least twice the expected weight on them and marked with hole or cover. And I can remember a story that I'll tell just very quickly. Uh, years ago, I got a phone call from a distraught uh, contractor who said that what had happened was there was a four by eight sheet of plywood that was just appearing to laying on the, the roof. And one worker said to another worker, hey, help me carry this. And both workers picked it up. And the one worker that was uh, wor walking forward fell through what appeared was the hole in the roof that that uh, cover was covering and it was not secured. It was not uh, marked as hole or cover and he lost his life in that situation. So that's, I, I can, I'll never forget that call and how distraught that roofing contractor was. And, um, and that's just how easy something can, can happen. And so it's so important to be marking these things and taking these things, uh, these requirements seriously. So with that, I'm gonna turn uh, my portion over to, to Harry Dietz. Um, Harry is our, our Director of Risk Management, Enterprise Risk Management, and he's going to be covering ladders. Thanks, Sam. I just wanted to talk a little bit about ladders uh, because the, the numbers, as, as Scott alluded to initially, um, from ladder fatalities was pretty significant in 2018. And this, it, it, fortunately, this went down from 2017, uh, which was good. But 88 workers in construction uh, died from falls off of ladders, and, and that's about 8.5% of those uh, 1,008 construction fatalities that Scott had mentioned. So it's something that uh, in roofing, it's uh, uh, prominent because just about every job, a roofing worker is using a ladder to access that roof. Many times there might be interior access or maybe a, a scaffold stairway or something like that. But uh, we focus on it a lot because of uh, the fact that uh, they're used so often and the impact is so serious about it. And it's, it's usually one of the, uh, well, it's always been the, one of the top five uh, in terms of OSHA citations, at least uh, since I've been uh, doing this. Um, so, so I'm going to uh, talk about just a couple of the OSHA regulations kind of to focus on uh, because some of them have a, a, uh, an effect on, on uh, the safety of the workers uh, significantly. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was securing ladders. It's focused really on uh, subpart X 1053 B6, 7, and 8, which really relate to uh, using ladders on stable level surfaces and making sure they don't slip, they're secured in some way at the bottom to pre prevent somebody from knocking into it and knocking the person off the ladder. And this is kind of a critical thing that sometimes we don't focus that much on. We focus a lot on the ladder being secured at the top, but the CPWR study that was so good, preventing falls from ladders in construction, that they did in 2010 was really interesting because they looked at over 300 folks who came into the emergency room and uh, had in, uh, occupational uh, sufferers who fell off of a ladder, and they found that 40% of those falls were the result of a ladder moving in some way. And of those 40%, most of that was because uh, that they moved at the bottom. So we think this is kind of critical to, to uh, think about and what you can do uh, to prevent it. And there's a lot of different techniques you can use to, to not just barricade the ladder, but tie it off pretty securely at the bottom. And it's, it's probably a good thing to think about in addition to tying off at the top. Of course, the uh, ladder angle is another thing that is mentioned in the OSHA regulation in terms of how to do it, and you'll see if you look at the 
uh, instructions from the man, uh, manufacturer. It'll also be in there, this magical one quarter ratio that uh, the uh, ladder is going to be set at, a, uh, uh, at an angle so that represents one quarter the, uh, the distance. For every foot it goes up, you, you divide by four and that's how far the bottom should be from the, uh, from the base of the structure. A great resource for this a lot of folks have different training techniques that they use. If you say you, you put your feet at the bottom of the ladder and hold your arms straight out, they should basically touch the side rail without uh, any effort. Uh, but another great thing to use, NIOSH recently came out with a ladder safety app that has a whole lot of information about, in there about uh, ladder selection and, uh, and inspection and use, the things that you're supposed to do to properly use a ladder. And one of the things that it does for you, it can tell you if the ladder is at the proper angle. And we, we mentioned this a lot in our day-long fall protection class, that it's a great tool to have. And if you haven't used it, you should really get it. And you could give it to, to at least every foreman, every superintendent, almost every worker on the crew, so that they know exactly that that ladder is squared up and, and set up the way it should be. Because this is pretty critical too in terms of uh, worker safety on the ladder. That angle is important. There's a reason why that one quarter ratio is, is set by the manufacturer and in use. Uh, and then there's a provision in the rules that, uh, that uh, requires the ladder to extend at least three feet above the upper landing surface. And uh, how we have really trained that, because the OSHA regulation is a little uh, fuzzy in this area as to what should be done, and it can provide sometimes for uh, uh, some discrepancies in application. So how, basically how we train this is the ladder goes three feet over and it has to be tied off. And, and that's something that's been in the industry for a while. That's kind of the, the standard for setting up a ladder, that when it's set up at the proper angle, that in some way it's tied off up at the top. And the beauty of things now is that there's a lot of different things that manufacturers have made that made ladder tie off a lot easier than just, you know, a bungee cord or something like that. There's other uh, clamps and uh, uh, equipment that can be used that make that ladder tie off a lot safer. And there's another uh, ladder walkthrough that I think you have a picture coming up that basically attaches to the top of the ladder and ensures a three, feet, a three foot uh, uh, extension over that landing surface. And it's a walkthrough that the worker gets up to it and walks right through the ladder. So that's kind of a, a cool way to do it too, to make sure you're safe and you don't have a chance of moving the ladder because you're, the forces are basically, as that worker gets off, they're walking straight through. Um, we talk a lot about uh, setting up the ladder and, and setting it up away from things like, as you see in this picture, a doorway, a stairway, things like that can, that can cause problems, setting it against this, this railing. But also in terms of electrical, because uh, roofing workers are always going up in uh, somewhere where there's a power drop and they have to make sure that the ladder is really away from there. We say here that ladders have to have non-conductive side rails and, and this, such as wood or fiberglass, that's not in the OSHA regulation. That's, that's something we put in the slide. And we put that in there as kind of a discussion point when we do our classes because we want folks to know that wood is not necessarily a magical ingredient. So we, we talk about that as a discussion starter to see if everybody agrees that wood is non-conductive because in reality, it can conduct electricity and it's something that we wanna focus on and make it kind of a learning point at that, at that moment. But fiberglass is really the way to go. Aluminum, obviously, one of the better conductors of electricity. So uh, in ladder setup, we want, in terms of the regulation, it doesn't have a standoff like say the scaffold section does where it's a three foot or 10 foot standoff or say like something more specific like in the crane standard. But, but I think the focus is on the non-conductive side rails, but also to tell folks to watch where they set the ladder up that, that where a service drop is, like in this case, not the best approach. And so here's that picture of that ladder walkthrough that I was mentioning before. Uh, and the OSHA rules uh, have a couple different things in there about uh, the use of a ladder and how to, to use a ladder properly so you're not gonna fall. Uh, one of the things, face the ladder when going up and down. Uh, use at least one hand to grab the ladder when going up and down. And we'll talk about this in a little more detail kind of at the end. And don't carry any object or load that could cause you to lose your balance. So that, that has become uh, something where we see a lot of, of folks um, 
who, let's say for their service crew, they're giving their service crew backpacks to carry up some of their materials. Uh, you know, in the old days, it was pretty common to see roofing workers carry up a bundle of shingles and flip it off onto the roof, uh, and obviously not the safest way to do it. So uh, following the, the, the probably better practice of don't carry anything up a ladder because that's when bad things are gonna happen. In terms of resources, you know, we have toolbox talks and a pocket guide related to a lot of different issues, and ladders are in there. CPWR has some great stuff on hazard alerts and toolbox talks too, uh, and the manufacturers are good sources of instructions along with American Ladder Institute that's also good. So um, let me just talk a little bit about, you know, last year OSHA came out with a letter of interpretation. You know, the regulation says that each employee has to use at least one hand to grasp the ladder when going up or down. And then OSHA came out with a letter of interpretation saying that uh, the, the intent of that is really that there's three points of contact. And, and we basically like the principle of three points of contact, that that's gonna make people safer, that there's three points of contact. When, it, when we uh, started talking about this, and we, you know, we've talked about this before, even before this letter of interpretation, was what exactly is the protocol? Because we have discussions with some folks uh, at NIOSH and at uh, uh, other uh, safety organizations who say, you know, it's better to grab the rungs because that's where your strength is versus a side rail. So um, we talk about this, this procedure of using one hand to grasp the ladder, uh, but I wanna illustrate it with a couple of videos. And, and this we hope is a discussion starter for uh, how folks are doing training and what they're, what they're doing in terms of keeping workers safe. So Jessica has got to uh, play these uh, through the WebEx. So hopefully we can get these started and, and they'll come through. This is, this is Tom going up a ladder, and he, I think everybody agrees it look pretty safe. And he's using what, what basically is an alternate method. When his left hand goes up, his right leg goes up. And so it looks like it's pretty safe, I would think. I, I would think everybody would agree that that didn't look bad. So now, that's at normal speed, and he looks pretty safe. His body is in between the side rails, right? He's not shaking the ladder one to one side or another, he looks pretty safe. So now what we wanna do, we wanna look at that in slow motion and think of it in terms of right, what go. the OSHA regulations say and what three points of context says. And Tom was not hurt during the filming of this video, so that's the good news. So as you can see, in slow motion, what kind of looked like it was a pretty good climb really seems to fly in the face of our three points of contact concept. So each time he makes a move, he's, he's only at two. So, what, what we wanted to look at was, is there, is there, a, um, is there a, uh, uh, a better a sequence here in terms of training? What's, what's the thing? Because here's what really, when we slowed them down, here's what really three points of contact truly looks like. Okay, you got And you can see he's, 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 now this is something we, we, we noticed it was more deliberate and he's got to think about making sure he's got a foot secure before he moves a hand. And obviously, you know, I don't know that anybody has seen too many people go up a ladder that way, but according to what we're thinking about in terms of three points of contact, that seems to be the, the, the approach. So, so now we want to just finally look at, as, as we've talked about this in our day-long fall protection class, or uh, I, I did a program on it at the International Roofing Expo, was ladder climbing using the side rails, which is, as we approach people with this, they said, well, you know, in roofing, you're not going to grab the rungs because the rungs are all full of asphalt or glue or whatever and mud. So it, we, we shot one with the side rails to kind of see if that was going to be the solution. Go. 
and you can see each hand is it's sliding uh, it's sliding along the side rails, and so he's he's technically always uh, maintaining three points of contact. So it, again, we like the idea of three points of contact. What we're wondering is, are we are we training it in the right way? And so that's why we 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 like to get more input from folks on this as to whether uh, you know the side rails is the way to go, because we know there's there's folks who who uh, uh, disagree because they they know the grip is better on rungs, but we think it's a good conversation starter in terms of uh, the approach to ladder training and and why that's significant. So, um, thanks again. I'm gonna I'm gonna get over to Rich now, who's gonna talk about rescue, and uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Jessica, if you'd like to give me control here, that'd be fantastic. I have to tell you, Jessica, I'm a little disappointed that we didn't do a uh, video webinar. I, I actually got out of my pajamas for the first time, I think, in the last month. Um, <laughs> that, that being said, uh, I'm going to be covering the next portion of this program, and I'll do it relatively quickly. I know we've approached the hour already, but I'm going to go through this, and hopefully we get some good points across. So my section is on fall protection or fall rescue plans. And the thing about this whole program is that Anytime we deal with fall protection, ladder safety, anything of that nature, we should be pre-planning for this. As a matter of fact, OSHA states that um, in subpart M that they envision a post-fall rescue as a pre-planned event. So what does that mean to us? Well, in reality, it means that we should be training our workers and we should be training on, on rescue equipment and specific techniques along with hazards associated with rescue operations. Now, here's the thing. We're not experts in rescue. So one of the first things I want to lay out there is that we should always be calling uh, 911 anytime we have a fall. The, the chances that somebody has been injured due to a fall or some type of, of uh, rescue type situation is very high. And what we have to remember when we call 911 is that most of these rescue workers aren't trained in high angle rescue. So what they're looking at is how can we get the, the person that has had the fall to them, or how can we get them to that person that has fallen? So we have to implement a rescue plan and have that in mind the entire time. So with that, let's move into rescue. And one of the biggest basic things of uh, rescue is that we have to do two things. Number one, we have to delay orthostatic shock, and I'll break that down in a few seconds. And then secondly, for those rescuers or for those uh, paramedics that show up, we have to bring that fallen worker to a supported surface, whether that's back on the rooftop or it's down on the ground. And it's all a part of what we have to plan for. So let's break down what orthostatic shock is or suspension trauma. Basically, what it is is that our body has, we've been in a fall and our body is now hanging over the edge and gravity is kind of feeding that blood pooling down into our legs. And we'll talk about what actually happens. But the, the key to this whole thing is that some researchers say that death can occur in a short period of time. What OSHA says with this whole scenario is that we must have a prompt rescue of a fallen worker uh, in, in the industry that we're in. In some situations, they don't really, you know, they, they do have some timings on that. As a matter of fact, when a worker is, is in a fall scenario and, they've, and they're near an electrical uh, circuit, according to the 1910 standards, OSHA says we have to have four minutes is the maximum amount of time that can be allowed for rescue. In other situations, the term is just prompt. So what is prompt? Well, to some people, it's going to be different for others. Uh, we're all going to react differently to that type of fall. I've been hoisted a number of times. Harry and Tom have both been hoisted a number of times, and we're somewhat comfortable with it. We've also had classes where we've had somebody hoisted, and they literally got their feet off the ground, and at that point screamed bloody murder, uh, to a point where we had to lower them back down. It was in this situation that we had to inform them that they'd probably be better in some other conventional means of fall protection where they couldn't get over the edge of the roof. So let's move forward a little bit. And I'm going to point out a couple of the things according to suspension trauma, and here's some of the, the indicators. So it can occur when legs don't move and legs are lower than the heart. So basically gravity is starting to pull that down. The other part of this is that our leg straps are actually starting to pinch off, or in a way, tourniquet our femoral arteries that run down the leg. When that starts to happen, 
Blood flow becomes impeded by leg straps and gravity. Blood starts to collect in the large leg muscles, and the return back to the heart decreases. At that same time, you have to remember, we've been in a fall scenario where our adrenaline is starting to pump, so our hormones are starting to pump into our body, creating a higher rhythmic beat to our heart. But here's the thing. Our heart then, our, our brain then under, understands that the blood isn't going anywhere, that it, there's some misfunction in here, and it starts to lower or decrease the, blood, the heart rate, and the blood pressure decreases as well. When this happens, we have some real troubles. And that's when the blood, starts, the blood flow to the brain starts to decrease. A victim can lose consciousness and, in turn, cause brain damage. And eventually, if all this doesn't go un, unchecked, can cause death. Not to mention the fact that there might be other complications to the fall itself. Remember, this isn't going to be falling onto a feather pillow bed. It's going to be falling over the side of a building or down a rooftop or over the edge where other things can happen, such as broken bones, such as uh, cuts, bruises, and other things, and even unconsciousness. From a worker's standpoint, some of the signs that they can be talking to a rescue are they're going to they're be fainting. They're going to be shorting out. They're going to be basically in and out of consciousness at some point. They're going to have shortness of breath, nausea, possible dizziness or sweating, hot flushes, paleness. And here's the real bad ones, a narrowing field of vision or loss of vision, which in turn leads to increased heart rates and could include death. So once we come to this situation, we've had a fall, we have to look at what is the rescue equipment available to us. Now, there's going to be things on site that we can use. You know, Larry just, uh, Harry just spoke of ladders. Uh, that's one of the rescue devices that could be on a job site. We could push it over to a fallen employee. Um, we could use scaffolding. We could use personal lifts. We could also even use pulleys or winches or dis descent devices that are on site. They're made as long as we have a pre-plan for fall protection. Other rescue equipment that is in some cases available and, and those of you that do mountain climbing or have been around the field long enough may, may see some of these and recognize some of them as typical mountain climbing content, uh, information or, or rescue equipment. The one in the middle is the one I'd like to point out um, a, as quickly as possible, and that's the SRL device, the yellow device. It's a slow or a, a descent device that can actually be uh, turned on in the case of a fall. So... In this situation, somebody has fallen over the roof. If a switch is turned, this cable system will lower that person to the ground where they can then get off the system itself. The one thing I want to make sure that you all understand with this situation is that make sure that cable is long enough that we're not putting them into a higher risk. The question that comes up often is what about single workers? We have a lot of crews in the roofing industry that go out on, on calls. NRCA has written a letter of recommendation that basically states that we'd like to see more of the two-man crews out on job sites. Because here's the thing, with rescue situations in a fall scenario, a person may not be able to make a call using a phone or a two-way radio. It is an option. However, it's, it's highly recommended that two-man crews are out there so that 911 can be called uh, in a different way. So again, let's go back to the two basic elements of rescue. The first thing is to delay orthostatic shock. The second is to bring the fallen worker to a supporting surface. Let's delve into that delaying orthostatic shock, and I'm going to show you a couple different techniques for rescue that you can use. The techniques are going to include the use of cell phone and two-way radios, which we discussed isn't the greatest of options, self-rescue lanyards, which is just like that SRL device that will lower you to the ground. The next five are going to be techniques that you'll see on a video here, and I'll have Jessica take over for a second here. But basically, we're going to show you the bathrooms technique, suspension trauma slaps, straps and slings, lifeline loop and prussic loops, and lastly, we'll show you the foot wrap. So let's move right into those videos. The first one is going to be a bathrooms chair uh, rescue technique. And if Jessica, if you would take over and show the videos, that'd be fantastic. So now, as you can see, I've been raised to a height to simulate a fall over the edge of the roof. The first technique I'm going to teach you is that of the use of a bosun's chair. So no, I'm going to actually use the harness to, to actually make a seat to sit in, removing a lot of the pressure from my groin area. So in order to do this, what we want to do is actually get to the straps around our butt and actually try and move them up somewhat like this, and it completely will relieve that stress from the groin area and, and that pressure in that groin area. 
And in this situation, I feel like I could comfortably sit here for, for a lot longer than I could have had I been in the other situation. And recall what I said earlier was that this can be used at, with an SRL or with a lifeline system. So yeah, one of the nice things about the Bostrom's chair is if we have an SRL, this is one of the techniques that can be used. Some of the other techniques that I'll show you coming up are specific to use, use of a lifeline, where if we were to have a fall, the lifeline would be hanging next to us, and we would, able to, we would be able to incorporate uh, some of these rescue techniques with the use of that line. The first one, of course, could be done either way. Uh, the Boston's chair could be used with an SRL, or it could be used uh, with, with a lifeline hanging next to you. So Jessica, if you want to show the next one, it's the prusik loop. And this is kind of an old timers uh, type of scenario. I know a lot of the old timers that I used to work with for years used to always carry a pair of prusik loops right on their harnesses or attached to their belts or somewhere on their body. So let's go ahead and show that one, Jessica. In this next technique, I'm going to teach you another method to use to self-rescue. It's called the prusik loop. I have here one here hanging on my chest, and basically you could keep a rope or a system or a loop of sorts on your side, in your pocket, on your harness tied somewhere, or in other scenarios, you could even untie your boot or your shoe and grab a lace. Prusik loop is quite simple in that all we do is we take the, the rope and wrap it around multiple times to create a loop of sorts that when tightened will actually tighten around the rope. In this situation, I basically take the loop, I've wrapped it around the rope, and now, once again, I have another foothold where I can relieve the pressure off my groin area. All right, great. Thanks, Jessica. So that second technique there is that prusik loop is a very valuable one in that if we don't have other resources on us, we can actually take a boot lace or we can take, if we have those on our, on our harness anywhere, we can actually wrap them around. If you had two of them, you could actually start to create a ladder system where you could climb back to the roof. And these are just, of course, suggestions. The thing about this is, all of the techniques that we show you today are techniques that do need practice. They're things that will take some time for, for individuals to get used to doing. So we always advise people, if you're going to show these things, make sure that people have a chance to actually practice them and see how they would work in the situation. Okay, Jessica, if I can take over again here. Uh, the next uh, situation or the next type of technique is the suspension trauma straps. These are uh, post-market sales, as Tom had mentioned. You know, the safety industry is coming out with new, new things every single year. Uh, some new harnesses have these attached to them already. Otherwise, they can be bought post-purchase uh, post of a harness and attached to that harness. And it's quite simple. These things can drop down in the case of a fall, and they leave a lot of that uh, the orthostatic shock that we saw in the other videos. So go ahead, and Jessica, if you could play that video. In this next technique, I'm going to show you a suspension trauma straps. These can be purchased aftermarket or many harnesses nowadays come with them. The one that I'm using today, basically the manufacturer makes these in zip little pouches that hang down from the side of your harness. And I'll drop these down one at a time. Drop down the right side and drop down the left side. And what I've done on this scenario is I've taken a hook and I, I'll reconnect it with the other side in a little loop and I'll drop this down by my feet. In this scenario, I basically stand in this and stand up relieving all the pressure off my groin area once again. And with this, it can be single strap or double strap as we have it. But the basics behind it is that we're trying to relieve that pressure from the groin area. In this scenario, once again, I could stand for a long time before being rescued. And let's face it, that's the real reason we're teaching these techniques today. All right, great. And as you can see in this picture here, there's, there's both the one on the left, which is the one I used, but there's also single straps, which basically do the same exact thing. It's just a pre-made loop, one drop down. And what you're just trying to do is alleviate those straps that run across the legs so that it, it allows that blood flow to still gain access. Um, and that would be great. Jessica, if we can move on to the next one, or if you can give me control here again. Great, we'll go on to the making of a lifeline loop. Um, quite simply, we're taking that lifeline that's at, at, a, at a time of a fall would be hanging next to us and in turn basically tying a knot in a loop so that we could stand up on it. And Jessica, if you'll show that video. In this next scenario, we're going to be talking about another, another situation. I've fallen over the edge of the roof and I have a lifeline system on. 
What we're simulating here is that the rope grab is above me and that the excess lifeline line is down beside me. So in the first technique I'm going to be teaching, we're going to be talking about a lifeline loop. And it's quite simple. Basically, tie a loop, step in it, and relieve the pressure from your legs. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by getting the loop set and tying a knot into it. You want to make it big enough because believe me, when you're hanging, trying to get a loop around your boot is, is not as easy as it might seem. So what I've done is I created a knot, I created a loop, and now I can put that around my boot. And with that, I can then stand up and relieve the pressure from my groin area. Quite simple, and to be honest, I think I could stand here for quite some time as compared to hanging. All right, excellent. Now, in order to save some time, these slides will be available to you, but the next one um, I want to show you is is actually a foot wrap, and it's got a number of different steps, and these will be available to you afterwards. But what I'd like to do is actually go to the foot wrap technique and actually show it on the video here. In this next technique, I'm going to be talking about the foot wrap, and it's quite simple. Go to the inside of your foot. So Jessica, if you'll show that, great. Wrap a loop, come over the top, and actually step into it, and you can step up, relieving the pressure from the groin area once again. All right, great. Now, remember, I've practiced these things over and over again. We've gone through a number of the fall protection classes. So what may seem easy uh, on the videos is something that should be practiced. Remember, OSHA considers a fall, uh, a fall rescue a pre-planned event. And in order to pre-plan that, it should be practiced ahead of time. Uh, as they always say, practice makes perfect. So that kind of sums it up for the rescue portion. But a couple more slides I just want to share with you. One of the biggest things is we have to understand that um, we are not, you know, we are not the experts when it comes to dealing with the medical side of things. So if we do have a fall, of course, call 911. That's one of the first things to do. But if we don't have one, uh, paramedics or the rescue squad has not arrived yet, and you have got that rescued worker uh, in a position, whether it's on the roof or on the ground, make sure to carefully handle the rescued worker. They could have you know, broken bones, bruises, different issues that, that are occurring, uh, along with the fact that the quick release of pooled blood from the legs can cause cardiac arrest. Remember, that blood has been pooled up in those legs um, and hasn't been oxygenated the way that it normally should. Uh, so this can cause a cardiac arrest. Make sure that those, those workers are in a position of comfort on the ground or comfort on the rooftop uh, for easy transport to the hospital. And if at all possible, if you have oxygen available in any way, shape, or form, make sure you're administering oxygen to those people. The last slide I want to share, of course, we've had a fall. We've rescued our worker. OSHA requires now that any of that personal fall arrest uh, equipment uh, that has been subject to impact loading, uh, subject to the forces like those during a fall, they need to be removed from service. And there's a lot of different ways to tell. Most of the, the harnesses that we have most of the equipment that we have nowadays has some type of an indicator. SRLs, as seen on the top, have a little plastic piece that, that pops out, or it's an aluminum piece that pops out in the indication of a fall. <laughs> if that's the case, those things aren't necessarily to be tossed out, but they can be reserviced or retooled by industry. Remember, these SRL devices can cost anywhere from $500 to $3,000, depending on what you get. So in many cases, they can be reserviced and recertified as, for use. Harnesses, on the other hand, ropes, on the other uh, typically will have a stretch mark or a pull mark or stitching that shows up, as you can see in that below. Uh, and it basically shows that we want to make sure that those things are out of service. So again, I, I, I want to reiterate, all of this rescue portion is all about pre-planning and planning for an event that really isn't going to be easy to plan for. But it's something that we can do. It's something that we can practice for and, and make sure that we're training our employees in the proper way. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Jessica and Tom to wrap up the program with any questions that we may have. Thanks, Rich, and thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, Tom, if there are any questions that you've seen that you want to go ahead um, and answer right now, feel free. But I do, I'm thinking what we can do since this ran over with the tef technical difficulties and everything is I'll pull all of the questions that have been submitted um, and compile them in a document, get some answers from our presenters. 
Um, and then when I send a PDF of the slides and the recording to everyone who registered, I can include um, the Q&A as well so that um, we don't have to stay on the line sorting through all of these great questions right now. Um, Tom, how does that sound um, to you? Yeah, Jessica, that, that sounds fine. You're right, we're a little bit long here, so thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and yeah, thank you again for everyone, um, all of our presenters, Rich, Harry, Tom, um, I know Scott got off, but Damon, tell him thank you. Um, and thank you everyone on the line for bearing with us during um, the challenges with sound. Um, I again will make a recording available um, to everyone as soon as possible and that will be emailed out automatically. So hopefully if you did miss any part of it because of the sound issues, um, you can just go back and, and watch on the recording.